Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. Uh, I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University here in the nation's capital. Christian is in Berlin, where apparently the internet just isn't what it should be. Um, so, um, that is unfortunate. The Washington History Seminar, for those of you who don't know, is a collaborative effort of the American Historical Association and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. We have been in business since 2010, uh, presenting new work uh, of historical scholarship uh, to academic and non-academic audiences alike. Um, we get a few pieces of business out of the way at the outset. We'd like to thank Pete Bierstecker and Rachel Wheatley, the Wilson Center and the American Historical Association uh, for their behind the scenes efforts to make these sessions uh, possible uh, week after week after week. Uh, please note, we record these sessions uh, and they will be posted on our institution's respective websites uh, uh, in the very near future. So you can come back uh, and uh, listen to this or tell others uh, to watch it. Um, Please note, we're also um, uh, allowing people to get in the queue early. Uh, if they wish to pose a question, you can use the raise hand function. Um, in that case, I get to call on you, you unmute yourself, and then you get to pose the question, or you can use the raise hand function on Zoom, in which case you write it out and I get to read it. If you can, use the raise hand function so we can hear the question in your voice. Um, just FYI, uh, one week from today, um, we have a session uh, with Stephanie Freeman entitled Dreams for a Decade, International Nuclear Abolition uh, and the End of the Cold War. Please join us in one week's time for that session as well. Okay, that business is out of the way. We can get the seminar fully going. Our featured speaker this afternoon is Brooke Blower, who received her PhD from Princeton University. She's an associate professor of history uh, at Boston University. And she's the author of Becoming Americans in Paris, Transatlantic Politics and Culture Between the World Wars, published by Oxford University Press in 2011. That book won the Gilbert Chouinard Prize for Society of French Historical Studies and the James Hanlon Best Book Award from the New England Historical Association. She's also the co-editor of The Familiar Made Strange, American Icons and Artifacts After the Transnational Turn, published in 2015, and volume three of the Cambridge History of America and the World, published in 2022. A recent NEH Public Scholars Fellow, she was awarded, she was also a co-founder, excuse me, and an editor of the journal Modern American History. And this afternoon, she will be speaking from her latest book, uh, Americans in a World at War, Intimate Histories from the Crash of Pan Am's Yankee Clipper, published in August by Oxford. Brooke, it's great to have you. I look forward to hearing what you got to say. Thank you so much, Eric, um, and thank you all for coming. Thanks especially to Eric and Mary for uh, being here and, and doing comments. Um, I'm going to begin with some scene setting. I was told not to use images, so you'll just have to imagine uh, the scene. Um, and this is an event that is well known to some history World War II buffs, uh, but it's based on never before used archival documents. And then after I set the scene, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this project and how I came to it and what I hope it shows. So we're going to start on February 21st, 1943. Pan Am summoned 27 passengers and a dozen crew for trip 9035 to LaGuardia's Marine Air Terminal. So this is a, an international commercial flight at a critical turning point in World War II that was to take place on Pan Am's celebrated seaplane, the Yankee Clipper, which would island hop across the Atlantic to Lisbon in neutral Portugal. Let me tell you a little bit about um, uh, some of the people uh, who are on this plane. One of them was a woman named Tamara, who was a Russian speaking Jewish refugee from the Ukrainian Civil War, who became a Broadway star and was now on this flight because she was volunteering abroad with the USO. On board also was a man named George, a member of the so-called Republican Eastern establishment from an old stock elite German Jewish family who distrusted Roosevelt and the Democratic Party, but he also saw Anglo-American law and constitutional government as the world's best hope for civilized peace. And this outlook led him early to the military preparedness movement. 
For the past year, he had been a major on, on General Eisenhower's London staff, where he was in charge provisioning American troops on UK soil. Then there was Frank. He came from a family of Czech speaking immigrants who had settled in Iowa. He was a former Olympic athlete who then spent the 1930s selling American goods across Southeast Asia and the Middle East, where he became deeply committed to the project of Western colonialism. He had been living it up as a bachelor in Manila, then Singapore and Batavia until forced to flee and almost killed during the Japanese invasion. He was now headed to North Africa after talking his way into a job as a radio broadcaster. Also on board was a man named Harry, one of Standard Oil of New Jersey's top international negotiators who had spent World War I trying to protect the company's assets in Romania. In fact, he was briefly arrested there for commercial espionage. After the war, he moved to France where he headed up Standard's Paris office and brokered important deals for the company in Iraq and the Netherlands East Indies. Then there was Manuel, a Spanish immigrant who had co-founded one of the, the most important Spanish shipping agency in the Spanish speaking world. Vessels entrusted to his care had plied the waters between New York, Latin America and the Iberian Peninsula since the first world war. And they had been aiding far right wing uh, agents at least since Francisco Franco's coup which had overthrown the Spanish Republic. He was suspected of fascist sympathies and was in fact arrested for smuggling oil and radio transmitters and other materials off of Brooklyn Pier only days after the United States entered the conflict, but he escaped conviction and his technically neutral boats still crossed the Atlantic, sometimes transmitting information about allied convoys to German submarines. The last passenger I wanna tell you about is Ben. He was a proud Southern Baptist and a South Carolina Democrat also a seasoned newspaper man who had reported from Roosevelt's Washington, London during the Blitz, and Moscow under the threat of invasion. But witnessing uh, colonial rule up close by the British in New Delhi during the Quit India campaign months before had sorely tested his conviction that the Allies were merely fighting the good fight. And he had risked his press credentials, in fact, to report out that fact. So these and 21 other passengers clustered in Pan Am's waiting room. And as they did so, Captain R.O.D. Sullivan, or Sully as people called him, the pilot, the pilot for this flight, emerged from the airport code office, clutching classified data and route instructions, which he would lock in a safe on the flight deck. Now, Sully had joined Pan Am in 1929 when it was still only a risky startup, the first viable international American airline. And he had helped pioneer the airline's Latin American and Pacific routes during the 1930s. Now he was commanding secret military missions between South America and Africa, as well as regular commercial flights to Lisbon. With more than 14,000 flying hours under his belt, he had just become weeks before the first person in the entire world to fly the Atlantic 100 times. So finally that morning, two bells signaled the passengers to follow the dozen crew members to board the seaplane. On the first floor deck, passengers arrayed themselves in seating compartments, while on the second floor flight deck, the crew arrayed themselves at their own workstations. After Sully ordered the crew to hoist the sea anchor and cast off the mooring lines, the craft eased away from the dock and he opened the throttles and sped past Rikers Island. After reaching full power, it took roughly 30 seconds for this aircraft model, which is a Boeing 314, to break free from the surface of the water. It was literally a flying boat. The motors whined as it climbed away from the channel until about 8,000 feet when Sully leveled the plane off. A course for Bermuda was set. After setting down in that British colonial outpost to refuel, the clipper would continue overnight through the dangerous mid-Atlantic air gap known as the Black Pit to Horta Harbor in the Azores. And tomorrow, after setting off from Horta and flying all day without incident to mainland Portugal, it will crash in Lisbon's Tagus River, killing 24 of the 39 passengers and crew on board. Lives, and careers would soon be destroyed in an instant, and a great airship, a symbol of a distinctive era in American foreign relations, would be reduced to scrap. But because the plane crashed, it crashed, it preserved a paper trail, which gave hints of two decades worth of personal and political choices that had brought these Americans to this place. So my book, Americans in a World at War, traces the backstories of seven people on that plane. The seven worldly Americans I just introduced you to, their personal histories, their politics, and the paths that led them toward war. Only two of them would survive the crash, and 
my editor would want me to say, you have to read the book to find out which two. Now the, editor, the individuals profiled here are not stand-ins for larger groups. They are complex people who were in some ways representative, but in other ways exceptional. They live lives of contradiction and complication like most human beings. As their biographies accumulate, intersect, and sometimes work at cross purposes, they defy expectations, spilling out over social categories, national borders, time periods, and other schemes for order. They put flesh and bone to otherwise hard to grasp events of global scale, and they invite those who follow them to revisit even well-known history with fresh eyes. Together, I hope they dramatize how a diverse cast of people were drawn into global crisis, how they navigated an era of unprecedented mobility and perilous independence, interdependence, sorry, and how their deep and sometimes contradictory international engagements would shape, but then also in turn be strengthened by, transformed or else derailed by the US war effort. And I hope they help to situate better the United States in the stream of world history in this period of time, and that they help to unsettle conventional American World War II narratives by portraying the war as an intense episode of imperial conflict, international development, and global engagement. Now, if you went back in time and you told younger me that I would spend more than a decade uh, researching and writing a book about World War II, I would have laughed you out of the room. Uh, I came of age in the 1980s and 90s during what Emily Rosenberg calls the World War II memory boom, when signs of the great war fought by the greatest generation, sorry, the good war fought by the greatest generation were everywhere. Uh, you know, Stephen Ambrose uh, books, uh, Steven Spielberg movies, 50th anniversary commemorations of the bombing of Pearl Harbor and video game reenactments of the D-Day invasion. The conflict, or at least the way Americans had calmly come to recount it, had seemed to me exceptionally well-traveled ground, and it was frankly the last thing I thought I would ever be interested in working on. But over time, I began to think more about the particularity of late 20th century American World War II narratives and what their storytelling conventions often obscured. U.S. historians, of course, have and continue to produce an amazing array of scholarship on the war, but in broad synthesis, the, the meta-narratives that have stuck have narrowed considerably over time. And I realized I was dissatisfied with a few really big things. First, the way that the war in retelling in American history had been bifurcated into two usually non-intersecting halves, the home front and the war front. It's really common for us to see in, the, in you know, when we do lecture courses on the war in books and so forth, to talk about the quote unquote men who fought and the people at home. And it seemed to me that this leads to mistaken assumptions about who is in fact where. Uh, the home front, for example, is not a civilian uh, space. It's a, there's an enormous GI presence uh, in the continental United States, a disruptive, a disruptive presence in many cases. And people, uh, the people at home, quote unquote, are also still going abroad, both as non-combatants uh, in uniform and also civilians traveling uh, through commercial air networks like Pan Ams. Second, the war abroad part of the story seemed to me, within the way we tell it in American history, to center on two main dramas. Military history is one area where we, we spent a lot of our, our focus, rightly so. Um, and the question that we ask often in recounting the military history of American World War II is how did the Allies win? And in order to recount that story, it leads us to focus um, on liberation stories, and it leads us to focus uh, overwhelmingly on the end of the war, the final chapters of the war. The other way we often talk about the war abroad um, is through diplomatic history, and in particular through high diplomacy, summits with Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt, and so on. And this too is driven by um, a question that leads to an emphasis on the final part of the war and a particular kind of overseas geography. Usually within diplomatic history, we're asking, you know, how did the war um, set up the stage for the, for the Cold War? How does, it, how does it sort of set the scene for the Cold War? So we have two different kinds of um, chronologies, or sorry, um, on geographies. We've got, you know, like um, Iwo Jima and Normandy, or we've got, um, you know, Tehran, Yalta, Potsdam. But overwhelmingly, these stories lead to just the very end of the war, where we, we place all of our emphasis. 
And then these truncated geographies and chronologies, it seemed to me, have also caused to a phenomenon where caused contributed to a phenomenon where U.S. histories of the war have gotten more and more divorced over time from non U.S. histories, from sort of other world and regional histories of the war. I mean, if you only got your World War II history from recent Hollywood films, you'd be forgiven from even thinking anybody other than Americans were storming those beaches at Normandy or Normandy when in fact Americans were in the minority uh, of, of those who were, who were storming those beaches. So some context is in order. Um, combat soldiers made up only a small fraction of the millions of Americans, both in and out of uniform, who scattered across six continents on the eve of and during World War II. Long before GIs began storming beaches and beyond the war's most famous battlefields, Americans forged extensive political and economic ties to other parts of the world. This included both non-combatants in uniform. Here's a striking statistic. Only 16, not 60, 16% 16 of American uniform personnel during the war saw ground combat. So a tiny portion. And civilians, again, were also still traveling abroad, uh, not least on those uh, Pan Am commercial air networks. So I wanted to try to write a history of Americans in a world at war that captured some of this, uh, something that more fully portrayed the momentous, indeed calamitous first half of the war, sort of a history of Americans in the world at war before the Allies were winning, and something that could dramatize um, the mind-boggling global canvas on which Americans' participation unfolded, as well as something that put American history of the war in fuller conversation with non-US histories of World War II. And as I began thinking about this, I started imagining how I could do this. I, I, I pitched this to editors uh, as a story less like Saving Private Ryan and more like Casablanca. Um, and my original idea was to draft chapters on different kinds of non-combatants abroad. So I thought, you know, maybe I'll have like a chapter on relief workers and a chapter on correspondence and a chapter on businessmen and so on. But I wasn't really happy with this um, way of, um, you know, figuring, thinking about the project, because it seemed to me that this kind of approach to it would be an invitation to self-fulfilling prophecy. If I structure the book that way, I'm going to pick categories of people that I have decided in retrospect are important categories of people to follow. And then I'm going to find people that represent those categories to confirm my assumptions. Now, this is, of course, a common way that we have to write biography. We write about figures we deem important in retrospect, and of course, people who deem themselves important enough to leave us an archive to work with. But it seemed to me that 21st century databases, the digitization of vast amounts of historical documentation, from census records and phone books to yearbooks and newspaper articles and passport applications, that this had opened up an opportunity to push at the boundaries of biographical method. What if instead of approaching people as archetypes, I regard them as modes of inquiry? What if I began with a randomized sampling of individuals caught up in a shared tragedy, and let them determine the roots, the topics, the chronologies I follow. And weaving together these multiple biographies, I hoped might yield up productively dissonant accounts in place of master narrative. It was a way to sort of tell a bird's eye, uh, or, you know, a global story without resorting to abstract bird's eye points of view. And once I decided on this, it didn't take me long to find the Yankee Clipper and the crash. Um, uh, because of wartime restrictions, newspapers released the names of only a few passengers on board, but a trip to the Pan Am archives at the University of Miami quickly turned up crew manifests and passenger manifests and survivor testimonies and all kinds of materials about this flight and the crash. So I began running down the 39 passengers and crew on board, and I found roughly a dozen who seemed possible to trace. And over time, I uncovered far more about some of them than I originally anticipated, and so I began to narrow the cast down to those whose biographies bounded off in the most sort of value-added directions. Each of them proved to be a unique challenge to research, and I'd be happy to talk about that in the Q&A if people are interested. And each of them are intrinsically interesting, but taken together, I think they offer a handful of important reminders and bring to life certain facts about Americans' experiences in this war. Not least, I hope they highlight the degree to which transnational connections, many of them forged long before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, informed and shaped the actions of not just interventionist politicians like FDR and his emissaries, not just foreign correspondents who, you know, who were in the anti-fascist camp, but all kinds of Americans. Americans in this era, even many of those labeled isolationists by their opponents, were remarkably cosmopolitan 
Indeed, they were curious and worldly in ways that I would argue Americans no longer needed to be after the United States emerged as a quote unquote superpower at the end of the war. Of the seven travelers profiled in my book, all but one, one of them was a child or a grandchild of immigrants, and two of them were immigrants themselves. Between them, they spoke almost a dozen different languages, and none of them had needed the bombing of Pearl Harbor to wake up to world affairs. It's just that they did not agree about which wars to fight, when and which sides to join. They disagreed about diplomacy and military strategy, the purpose of government, the place of women and people of color in their society, the role of the press, the merits of communism and capitalism, and the future of the planet's colonies. They rooted for different political parties, different empires, different futures, and they were haunted by different enemies and different wars past. So different events now in this war and different terrains captured their attention, broke their hearts, or steadied their resolve. But together, Thinking about them together encourages us to think more subtly about the chronologies and the geographic imaginaries we use to narrate the war. Because hindsight can teach us how and why the allies won the second world war and laid the ground for an uncertain peace. But thinking forward in time through the eyes of individuals instead dramatizes how much Americans headed into this conflict, not with ultimate victory in view, but still grappling with the fallout from previous global conflicts and still consumed by the passions and partisan divides of the 1920s and 30s. It brings to life the singular emotions as well as the contingencies and unknowns of the war's early years, and it offers a reminder of how comp prom compromising and complex this war was and drives home how quickly the world and individual lives can fall apart. How we narrate US experiences during World War II matters because the conflict continues to hold such a special place in the stories Ameri Americans tell themselves about who they are and who they wanna be. And in the 1980s and 1990s, Americans understandably turned to nationalist celebrations of US combat troops role in the allied victory to an honor an aging population of veterans to find a war to be proud of in the wake of Vietnam. But given the challenges of the 21st century, globe-wide threats to democracy, environmental perils that will require international cooperation and collective solutions, it's time to revisit Americans rode into and place among other people's during this signal conflict. Thank you. Rook, thank you very, very much. We have two discussants this afternoon, Eric Rauschway and Mary Dujak. Leading us off is Eric, the Distinguished Professor of History at the University of California, Davis. He holds an MA from Oxford and a PhD from Stanford. And he's the author of many books, including Murdering McKinley, The Making of Theodore Roosevelt's America, published in 2003, Blessed Among Nations, How the World Made America, 2006, The Money Makers, How Roosevelt and Keynes Ended the Depression, Defeated Fascism, and Secured a Prosperous Peace, Winter War, Hoover, Roosevelt, and the First Clash Over the New Deal, 2018, and most recently, Why the New Deal Matters, published in 2021. Eric, welcome to the seminar. Thanks very much, and, and thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a real pleasure to engage with the book and a scholar of this quality. It's also a real challenge to uh, do this because, of course, the traditional thing is to ask questions, and Brooke's introduction has answered a lot of questions already. So uh, I just want to say, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, you, Brooke, on this book. It's as readable a work of history, it's as fascinating a narrative as I have come across in a long time. Uh, as you've seen when Eric held it up uh, a minute ago, it's a very handsome volume. I can therefore assure you that it will fill a spot on a number of my holiday gift lists this year, and I hope that it will do the same for many of the people listening uh, and watching. So I think it'll be a welcome gift for a lot of the reasons that you've laid out. So everyone, please make a note of wherever you purchase books as to what to get for the holidays. Um, it's a beautifully conceived book. I think Brooke laid out some of that uh, just now. It would have been, as she's just suggested, one thing to write a book around that uncertain time in the first part of the war when it was not yet clear that the Allies would win. But I really think it's a stroke of genuine inspiration to build that narrative around a particular dramatic incident, the crash of the Pan Am Yankee Clipper, Clipper and to use the lives of the people or some of the people on board to develop the ways in which that uncertainty 
and that war, or arguably many wars, which we could talk about in a minute, uh, manifest themselves in individual lives. Um, perhaps still more unusual, though, than being a well-conceived book, it is a good idea that is well executed. Um, I think you've pursued uh, quite creatively and carefully a wide range of sources. You familiarize yourself with the histories of politics, business, law, theater, aviation, shipping, and a lot of other things. And in so doing, you've demonstrated an active and empathetic historical imagination, which is an ability to envision and to encompass the strange old world of this uh, now vanished past. So the book is not only beautifully conceived, but carefully constructed, which is a rare combination indeed. Now, for the purposes of sparking uh, discussion, I want to highlight two things you've sort of already touched on and kind of draw out a lot, some of the implications or ask you perhaps to draw out some of the implications for the way we think about the Second World War. First, the book really does show us a variety of Americans experiencing the world at war, and not just from 1939 or from 1931 or whenever it is you date the beginning of the Second World War, but really from 1914 onwards, as your section titles indicate. So one of the things I really like about the book is that it's narrative rather than argumentative. Uh, you show rather than tell, but for the purposes of this discussion right here, I think it might be appropriate for you to lift the veil and talk a little bit more about the decisions you've made and what you expect people to necessarily take away from it. You're taking the position, the Winston Churchill position, that this is the, the 20th century's 30 years war, effectively, uh, a continuous event from 1914 through 1945 or thereabouts, and properly embraced uh, as such. Now, that's, that's not an uncommon position to take, but it's one that might have, I think, uh, interpretive implications that in a book like this run under the surface, but I want you to try to take some time to draw them forth. How does it change? How should it change uh, our understanding of the Second World War to say that it's really of a piece with the first? Now, I heard, heard you say very fleetingly in your introductory remarks the word imperial, but I suspect that needs to come out more in the answer to this question, right? Uh, so that, that, that's, that's the first question is, you know, if this is really a 30 years war, as you've kind of suggested, what is, how does that change our understanding of it? And for the second point, now, I've been very complimentary so far, so I hope you'll forgive the, the slightest critical uh, remark possible. I don't think you need to be even a little bit defensive about writing about the Second World War, uh, which you are both in the note on method and in your prefatory remarks here. Uh, it's one of those things, like I would say, let's say the Grand Canyon or the Great Gatsby, that is popular because it's actually interesting and worth your time and attention. Um, so I think you would have had to apologize if you'd written a book that simply trundled over known territory using known evidence, which is what a lot of works on the Second World War do. Uh, and But just because there's bad history about something doesn't mean that the topic is itself a problem. This is why, you know, Max Hastings, when he wrote the one volume survey that he wrote in, in 2011, explicitly set himself the, the challenge of using, as he said, obscure anecdotage rather than well-known incidents to uh, describe the war. Again, this is where the construction of your book, I think, really pays off, because looking at people that we haven't heard from, you know, traditionally in histories of the war, it does that naturally, right? It leads you to illustrative incidents that we haven't heard. And as you say, they might not be representative, but they do show us kind of the nexus of these otherwise abstract con um, connections and forces that are at play in this world at war. So we get a lot uh, wonderful stuff in this in this book that my students often ask me about this sort of wonderful gray area of trade with neutral but uh, axis aligned Spain. Uh, we get a lot of the mechanics of Lend-Lease, which is, of course, close to my heart, but not to most people's. And it's this, you know, wonderfully flexible and complicated worldwide system. It's a genuine logistical achievement. And usually people just sort of wave at that, you know, and say that this is this thing that's out there. And, uh, you know, our George's story gets us uh, into the ways things work. And when you talk about some of Frank's broadcasts, you talk about the challenges that he faced in trying to make real uh, you know, the complex web of connections in, in that case, the Pacific world, um, that a legacy of empire that was transformed by the exigencies of war, which I thought 
must have been an example of your uh, authorial, authorial mind revealing a little bit of itself. You know, that was also the challenge that you were facing uh, in trying to, you know, sort of put flesh on these other otherwise abstract uh, problems. So you get a lot of wonderful anecdotage of your own because of it. Um, just parenthetically, I have to say, I was especially taken with the sad side effect of the Nazi-Soviet pact on uh, Tamara's production. The line, dancing Stalin would have to be cut, will be with me forever. Um, so I, 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 do want, I do want to highlight that moment. But I'm curious now, though, and you, you, again, you touched a little bit on this in your prefatory remarks, but I'd like you to kind of try to draw this out. In writing a book about people to whom, for the most part, the war happened, they're Americans in a world at war, not Americans waging a world war, right? Which I think correctly describes the felt experiences uh, of most Americans, even, even many in uniform, right? That this war was something that happened to them uh, rather than one in which they were the, the primary actors. That effect of focusing on people to whom the war happened and the choice of the date, which, as you say, you know, antedated your choice of an incident, right? The choice of the date, February 1943, means that the book puts the United States in a much more passive role. And it's an Americans in the book in a much more passive role. The book ends, the crash happens, uh, just at the point where the United States really begins to take much more of a leading role in the war. So. I appreciate your, your 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 sense that we should be looking forward, and I didn't didn't hear you say contingency, but I imagine you were thinking contingency at some point. But I wanted you to sort of draw out a little bit of what it does for us in our understanding of the Second World War to see it as something that happened to Americans, and in which the United States was really, at least up until near the end kind of in the in in the back seat rather than the driver's seat, and to what it means to stop of necessity at a point when that's just beginning to change. So those are those are my two questions and uh, and my appreciation. So thank you very much again for the opportunity and for letting me read the book early. Eric, thank you so much. Brooke, thoughts, responses? Yeah, so I mean, I'm a little worried about being called Churchill-esque about my <laughs> My my chronological framing. I mean, you you could have commented on the role of Churchill, the you know what how I use Churchill in the book, but I want to kind of pull together all of what you're saying to sort of reflect on um, a couple a couple different things. One, the chronology question you're asking me: What does it mean to to put World War One kind of in in really direct conversation with World War Two and 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 see them as a kind of whole period, and to stop at forty three. Um, you know, when I finished this, when I was revising it, I ended up writing a section in that I think is actually pretty important into the one, one of the interludes where I said, you know, up until this moment of this flight in early 43, um, I said something like the, the war had felt more like the noisy collapse of the 19th century colonial order than the dawn of American superpower. And it strikes me as as you know, there's this breaking point when the the end part of the war, it's like a totally different kind of war. And it and the United States is playing a completely different kind of role um, than what's occurred before. And I did kind of want to portray that, that that you know, the Allies are on their heels and Americans are deeply conflicted. They're they're not of us, you know, one mind about you know whether they should be engaged in the Pacific or the Europe and you know, all these. I think that that's exactly right. It's only at the end of the war that things start to congeal in a way, and that war that we now remember and usually commemorate um, and often teach in diplomatic and military history contexts um, really comes together. I mean, it, it 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 it's just not the same place that that the people that I was studying were were coming from. And so, yes, I think by putting it in the longer sweep of history between World War One and World War Two, um, it draws your attention to the um, importance of uh, colonial history and um, rising anti-colonial activism and and that aspect of the of the story to these sort of logistical supply questions. Um, you know, Southeast Asia plays a big role in, in my book and 
Um, the Dutch East Indies is like the center of the story, which, you know, we almost never do that when we do the US history of the Pacific War. Um, so for me, putting it, you know, in this broader context, it helps you see the economic, the colonial, the political, you know, messes that are just sort of snowballing and all kind of bleed together into these wars that we then together call World War II, but as you alluded to, are in fact multiple wars that kind of bleed, end up bleeding together. Um, so to me, that's helpful. I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to say it's a 30 years world war. I mean, I, but I, you know, I understand the utility of that. And I think it's, it's useful to disrupt the way that the chronology works in sort of our typical US history survey way of, you know, um, thinking about the chronology. So I would stick with that. I also, um, I didn't mean to be defensive about the fact that I worked on World War II. My tone was more like, I can't believe I worked on World War II because growing up, it was just like not in my view, maybe there's a gendered aspect to this. Um, you know, it just didn't seem like anything that I would have anything to say about. Um, I do think that when I started working on this, um, I started this in 2009. And a lot of the energy in U.S. history was elsewhere. It was, um, you know, it was on um, the political, you know, domestic political historians were really focused on the late 20th century. Um, there was a huge thing going on with the, the 70s, you know, um, and not a lot of people um, were, were doing a lot of thinking about World War II. That has changed dramatically in the last five years or so, I would say. And a lot of really good U.S. histories of World War II are coming out. Um, I would flag up um, Zach Fredman's work on American GIs in China during World War II. There's 100,000 Americans in China during World War II. And his work using Chinese, half Chinese sources, half American sources really unpacks the dynamics at work there and their long-term implications. Uh, Becca Herman, uh, who is working on U.S. military basing in Latin America during World War II and the kind of, you know, colonial um, dynamics and, and wartime dynamics that that um, put on the table. So there's some incredible work that has come out now. Um, it just, I took too long to finish the book. So it's <laughs> it took me a long time to finish the book. But when I first started it, no, you know, people weren't really like that into World War II. It seemed like there was a pause because there was a tremendous amount of energy in the 1980s and 90s surrounding all these uh, commemorations. And then it kind of died down. And you know, we're, you know, we're, we are, we're, we're kind of like herd animals and we kind of follow these different things. And, and so I was passe, maybe I, my, my defensiveness is reflective in that sort of feeling like I was doing something that seemed like not what I was supposed to be doing. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Before we move on, let me just remind folks that you can get in the queue by using the raise hand function. Just stand by patiently until uh, we get to that section, or you can type your question into the Q&A, but uh, there's no need to wait if you're inclined to step forward now. Our second discussant this afternoon is Mary Dujak, the Aza Griggs Candler Professor of Law at Emory University. She's a leading scholar of legal history and the United States and the world. She is the author of Wartime, An Idea, Its History and Its Consequences, Oxford University Press, 2012, Exporting American Dreams, Thurgood Marshall's African Journey, also Oxford, 2008, and a classic, Cold War Civil Rights, Race and the Image of American Democracy, Princeton University Press uh, in the year 2000. She's the editor or co-editor of a number of volumes, including Making the Forever War, Marilyn Young on the Culture and Politics of American Militarism. Her current book project, Going to War and American History, is under contract with Oxford, and she's published essays in Foreign Affairs, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and other periodicals. She founded the Legal History Blog, was elected 2017 president for the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations, and she serves on the Historical Advisory Committee of the U.S. Department of State. Mary, welcome back to the Washington History Seminar. If you could unmute. Someone had to do it. So I took responsibility for being the person with the mute problem, so none of you would have to suffer the fate. Um, I'm so happy to be uh, back at the Washington uh, History uh, Center um, uh, book event, which is just such a wonderful 
Um, you know, thank you, Eric and, and Christian, not only for having me back, but um, but for just continuing to host this really wonderful um, forum. And uh, great to see um, all of you, Eric and Brooke. Um, congratulations on, on this book. Um, I'd like to say a little bit about just for the audience, something about the writing um, and what the book is like for a reader. Um, and, and, and then I'd like to talk about methodology um, because really, um, even though uh, uh, Eric said, for reasons I understand that the book is narrative, not argumentative, I think what we've got is um, a deeply, um, deeply revisionist um, uh, effort to slay dragons um, in the uh, way that that uh, certain kinds of histories have been written. Um, so, so the book, um, you know, the Brooke Blower is a writer who can cause you to see pictures in your mind, um, and it's really a wonderful gift. Um, and it's it's you know we can't have pictures all the way through the manuscript right but um but she does sort of repeatedly at crucial moments um my experience anyway i can see what it looks like um when certain in my mind uh when certain events in the in the book happen um and that's then generating this connection with the reader um, that's really um, important and often unusual, right? I'm not just thinking about uh, what am I learning from the book and how does this affect other ideas, but it's really um, causing the reader to have this relationship with the text that um, is really quite sometimes very moving, um, sometimes terrifying, um, and sometimes humorous or surprising. So it's just a really interesting and wonderful reading experience. Um, and I should say that with Halloween coming up, if you want something horrifying to read, start reading now <laughs> and save the end uh, for when, after dark uh, on Halloween. It's, you know, I had trouble sleeping after I finished the book, um, but that's okay, you should read it anyway. Uh, so so the, one of the sentences I actually, um, like the most is in terms of the met thinking about method and and what brooks objectives are with the manuscript was actually one that that you kind of alluded to in your remarks and it's in a note on method which i actually turned to pretty quickly when reading um <clears throat> So, so she says, weaving together multiple biographies, I thought might yield up productive, product, productively dissident accounts, productively dissident accounts in place of master narrative. Um, and, and so productively dissident accounts. So Brooke Blower is a dissident, um, it dis dissenting from the methodology, the methodology of what, at least the methodology related to World War II, but really it's broader than that, um, I think. And um, so I, you know, I, I started thinking about other accounts where someone goes sort of grassroots, someone goes sort of down to the personal level to upset master narratives. And um, Charles Payne, I've Got the Light of Freedom, right? So that was a book that um, in some ways I found it frustrating to read because I couldn't figure out how some events lined up with the master narrative of the civil rights movement. But of course, that was his purpose, um, to center local people um, as a way of sort of shaking up uh, the way that the master narrative had taken hold and sort of picked out certain people who mattered in history. Um, and that then generated, you know, inspired so many other historians and, and, and ground up histories became a way of writing about the civil rights movement. Um, so in, so that's why I think this is this very kind of gently in some ways presented, um, dissident account um, that is really um, has the potential to kind of have an intervention um, in how we think about 
writing history. And, and then one of the questions is, well, what's the master narrative to upset? And you did address that in, in your opening remarks. Um, and, uh, you know, I think of other sort of classic World War II works. Um, when people write about individuals and really a sort of a person-centered narrative, it's often, I have just happened to have here, um, uh, Peter Stansky's The First Day of the Blitz. So one moment in time, and he's got sort of deeply narrated experiences of being in London the first day of the Blitz. And so that's one way that people use the sort of, um, you know, deeply narrated personal experiences. Um, but but Brooke is, is sort of doing this across time and across space. Um, and so in some ways, it's an a personal approach a sort of a individually sort of a, it's not really, you know, is it ground up? When I think of ground up, maybe it's because I think of the civil rights movement example, um, you tend to think of particularly particular communities acting in concert, but this is so different, right? Because it's dispersed individuals um, and they're having different experiences, but then what brings them together is this sort of time period um, and the approaching conflagration of World War II. Um, so it's methodologically very um, different and interesting in, in some ways from other sort of more focused individual um, accounts. Um, but the another way to think about the book is, you know, another book I was thinking of in relation to this is Dan Rogers' Atlantic Crossings. Because of course, <laughs> this is another Atlantic Crossing. Um, so because you don't do a methodological apparatus, you don't talk about that. Um, I think that's one thing, you know, historians are going to sort of want to hear that somehow. So I hope you'll write some big, you should give a big lecture or, or sort of, you, I'm sure, perhaps you already have sort of big methodological um, sort of uh, manifesto um, where you engage both some of the other more classic works on World War II, like David Kennedy's work. You know, it's not all Stephen Ambrose. You sort of pick an easy target in the book. <laughs> so pick other targets um, when you go big on this argument, um, but uh, uh, pick more sympathetic targets, I think, that his the historians might think are more sympathetic and, and we can think about who that would be. But, um, but, but really, um, how does this work um, help us think about how to do international history? Um, and international sort of histories are often focused on ideas, right? And Brooke is taking us to material objects, um, uh, taking us to, you know, the oil industry. <laughs> Um, and also patterns of corruption and subversion. Um, so there's all sorts of different kinds of interconnecting threads. So on some level, it's a more um, complex pattern of Atlantic crossing um, than what we see in the traditional sort of works in, um, in um, in you know the original Atlantic crossings, um, sort of that would you, you would otherwise see on on that bookshelf. So I really um, I think that's all I really need to, to sort of offer at this point. But I really wonder, um, you know, essentially what you think about the book as transnational history, and also could you kind of fill in a little bit more about what I see as your um, your uh, your um, revisionist um, and your deep, deep amb <laughs> revisionist ambitions. You know how should history um, evolve in, in the next generation um, if a cohort of young scholars and graduate students are following in the footsteps of Brooke Blower? Thank you, Mary. Brooke. Thanks, Mary. Um, so I want to pick up first on your point about narrative versus argumentation and i completely 100 percent agree with this that narrative is not the antithesis of argument but it's a way of presenting an argument 
Um, we know, you know, like Eric was bringing up, what dates we start with are making an ar implicit argument. Um, what attracted me to narrative technique here was I think that because World War II has such a, you know, presence in our culture, um, you know, a lot of historians have said some of the things that I that I think the, that my story is kind of also saying um, about the need to think about these different geographies and the chronologies and not just focus on the liberation stories and all this stuff. But I feel like until we produce narratives that give a different kind of experience for the reader that, you know, all, all the historiography we're producing saying all these things, it just doesn't, it, it needs to like sort of be narrated for it to stick with people. And I also think that narrative, narrative drives things home in ways that are really like meaningful and um, impactful. So just to give you one example of this, um, you know, we, we, we all, I don't know, we all, but you know, if you study world, you know about the Pacific versus Europe first strategy and the debate about whether you should, you know, allocate resources to conquer the Japanese or whether you should table that and not worry about that and, and put your force, you know, um, into um, being the Nazis first. That's like a, that's like a thing we know, but I felt like I didn't really understand that and what that meant until I experienced it through Frank's perspective. When he's, you know, run out of Java, nearly killed, his friends are interned, you know, he's watching his whole world, Southeast Asia, fall to the Japanese, and he's pleading, you know, please send planes, please do. And to me, you know, experiencing history that we know, that, you know, things we know through the eyes of individuals drives it home in a way that's really powerful. So for me, that, that, that just myself learning this history, um, I found that narrative did something that a kind of straight up history monograph couldn't do because I could, you know, I could say that, that that mattered to people who lived there, you know, but to feel it and follow somebody, it just seemed like it, it did something, um, something else. And it reminds me too of the whole, the um, explanation that cultural historians will often use about the difference between explaining and understanding. You know, my intent wasn't to explain to you World War II and here's how I think World War II is or what, but to, to have you understand it, you know, you know what I mean? I don't know if it makes sense, the difference between explaining and understanding, but just to be able to feel it in a way. Um, so for me, that's what narrative offered. Um, and methodologically and sort of where I would put myself in terms of the sort of evolution of transnational history, um, you know, I mean, the, thank you for comparing it to Atlantic crossings. You know that that's a big compliment. Um, you know, that came out in 1999. We did not have the kinds of digitized databases that we have now. Um, one of the, I wasn't thinking so much about Atlantic crossings. I was thinking a lot though about like Chris Bailey's um, big book. I was thinking about um, Emily Rosenberg's A World Connecting. These really big bird's eye global history, you know, studies of the late 19th and early 20th century. And those are incredible accomplished pieces of work, but they're bird's eye views. And so they cover all this area, but like, do we really feel like you could feel and taste and touch that, that era um, and understand it. And so to me, what was interesting was once I got into this, I didn't actually intend to do this. Um, I thought when I traced these people, I was going to use them as sort of a narrative conceit. And like, maybe I'd have a couple paragraphs on them. And then I would launch out and do a Chris Bailey thing or, you know, do, you know, a Dan Rogers thing and sort of tell a more traditional top down kind of transatlantic history of something, but use my people as like a, like a launch into it. But then I very quickly discovered that we can find people like in these amazing ways that we couldn't find them in 1999. Um, and I was able to dig out so much material to actually bring these people's experiences to life that I pivoted to doing something much more what people say, you know, as biographical than I had originally intended. Um, and then after I pivoted to that, I had another insight where I realized that I wasn't really doing traditional biography either. I mean, one, because the way we normally pick bio biography topic, you know, subjects is through, we've already decided who we're going to write about. And this was like happenstance that I had found these people. But I was also doing what I thought was more of micro history rather than biography. And the distinction that I would draw there 
is that I didn't, and this was really liberating when I figured this out, I did not feel um, required to tell all of their stories from cradle to grave to sort of tell a full account of these lives. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm like zeroing in on certain moments in time and bringing those moments to life as best that I can. So, you, you know, some people you hear a little bit about their childhood, other people you don't hear about their childhood. So it didn't, I didn't feel compelled to do the traditional biographical approach and combining, you know, the digitization of records and that allows us to find, you know, things we couldn't find, trace people across different landscapes, you know, old micro history, you had to have one location, you would go to the like municipal archive and you would look in the local records. But, you know, I don't, how do you know what locale these people are even in, you know? Um, those things I think have presented us not just in transnational history, but in all fields of history with opportunities to do projects we couldn't have done in the 20th century. You couldn't have done this project in the 20th century. You could not take a plain manifest and then spin out a story out of the people on board because you couldn't have found the people on board, you know. And the other thing, the thing I'm thinking about now is it also, I think, might present us with opportunities to take a fresh look at things we have archivally researched. So, you know, um, events that we've done really good archival work on, but we didn't have digitized sources. What would it look like? How would it be different if we use these, um, these resources now to rethink some of that older archival work? Probably this has more implications in transnational history because just of the nature of the kind of, you know, far scope of, um, of um, storytelling that we're probably trying to do. But I think even if you worked on domestic US history, you know, non -US, you know, all kinds of history, um, I think we're only really beginning to understand how revolutionizing these, these databases are in terms of what we can even imagine is possible. Thank you very much. So let's open this up to folks in the audience. We have a number of people whose hands are up. Uh, if Lewis Cooper could unmute, you can join the discussion. Okay. Um, thank you for the for for all the contributions. Just a couple of very quick comments um, on the framing of World War One and World War Two as a thirty years thirty one years war. <clears throat> I actually think that's not not an uncommon way to uh, to think about that period. Um, the example that that came immediately to my mind was was Eric Hobsbawm's The Age of Extremes, where in uh, like the <clears throat> opening pages of his first chapter, he uses the phrase the 31 years world war, the, the direct quote. And I think that's not, you know, Hobsbawm is the example that came to my mind, but I think it's really not uncommon. Second brief comment. Um, I happen to be very interested in the quit India movement. So uh, when I read this book, which I hope to do, I will be paying particular attention to that and how it influenced the outlook of the particular person whose name I don't remember from your preface but who was who was in india and was was influenced was was affected by that so i just i just wanted to make those two quick comments thank you thank you i immediately also thought of Hobbs, Hobbsbaum. um and i mean you know i guess churchill and Hobbsbaum got together and agreed on something that's kind of kind of interesting um i you know i agree i don't think it's i'm that's not the major contribution of this book to to think about world war 1 and world war 1 or world war 2 together um Although I do think it's interesting that you're talking about two British um, people, you know, the, the, that these are Brits. And in fact, in other parts of this war story, I've noticed that using non-U.S. history and thinkers, it's more common outside of U.S. history to think in this way than within U.S. history. If that makes if that makes sense. The 31 years World War thing is common European framing, but I don't know that it is in, in US history. I don't know that we do we do, do that as much. The Quit India campaign is really interesting. Um, and um, the way that um, my figure, Ben Robertson, uh, engages with it is quite frustrating and interesting because he is a white Southern quote unquote liberal. Um, and others who have looked at his life um, make the claim that by going to India and seeing the campaign, it makes him more open and supportive of black civil rights in the United States. And there's just simply no 
uh, evidence of this whatsoever. And it's in fact, he he's actually kind of an interesting character because he comes to all kinds of anti-colonial convictions and yet never, ever, ever backs off his um, his his sort of um, racial politics in South Carolina, which, um, you know, is, is reliant on Jim Crow. He's um, a classmate of Strom Thurmond, and he, like Thurmond, is an early advocate for Southern Democrats um, defecting to the Republican Party to sort of counter the, you know, um, outside influence that's being uh, pushed in this period from Northern liberals. Thank you. Andrew, is it Mayor? If you are there, yes, there you go. Please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. I, uh, I'm a, a former uh, professor at College of Staten Island, CUNY. I've studied uh, a period for some some time. I found uh, Brooke. Uh, I just did a brief review of yours, which I hope will get uh, get into choice. You can look it up uh, once they publish it. But I was very uh, enthused by the book, your unique approach. I want to follow up on the other question uh, relating to when Ben Robertson went to India. And apart from the uh, disparity in his, his actual uh, non-unhappiness uh, uh, with, uh, you know, any liberation and civil rights in, in his own area, he found a, a huge disparity in what Churchill was presenting and, and the, the uh, British Empire was presenting and the basic horrors of, of things like the Bengali famine. Uh, this, to some degree, is a novel uh representation of, of, of history, because I've unfortunately read uh, too many accounts the other way, uh, you know, proclaiming that uh, the British Empire was necessary for uh, for the survival of, of, of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. I'm just interested in, in whether or not you found uh, uh, any particular uh, reason for pinpointing this to, through Robertson, or whether you, or you feel, is he a... Uh, uh, a singular case, or, or did, did people like Frank and others, did they also feel uh, badly about the way that individuals are being treated in, in, in India and, and also in parts of North Africa? Thank you for that. Um, it You know, Americans' um, colonial politics are really complex and really interesting at this moment. And one thing that I learned from both Frank and Ben's story was that um, people kind of had a kind of whiplash reaction um, to a lot of these events of the war. So, for example, um, Frank is extremely angry at Gandhi and um, very annoyed at Indian nationalists um, and their Quit India campaign in the middle of 42 when it, when things are really, you know, looking pretty desperate. And the fear is, of course, that the, the Japanese and the and the and the access, you know, the Nazis and the uh, Times are going to converge um, on India from both sides. So there's kind of a dip that happens where a lot of Americans who had been somewhat nominally supportive of Indian independence or, or negotiation, um, it falters in, in 1942. It falters after the Crips mission fails because it seems like, um, you know, from American points of view, this was um, something to explore and the Indian uh, nationalists dismissed it fairly outright. Uh, and then the unrest surrounding the Quit India campaign and this really, really, you know, dire moment of the war, um, uh, made a lot of Americans, um, you know, sort of back off, I think, some of their 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 commitments to sort of thinking about a world after the war um, that wasn't that wasn't so so much structured by um, these traditional colonial powers. Um, so Ben is unusual, I would say, in that a lot of the American uh, foreign correspondents who were there in India at the same time he is, um, they are also more pro-civil rights in the U.S. So Ben is in this very particular place. Um, one thing that I found really interesting was going into the British archives and looking at the British records on American correspondence and using that as a source to really understand the place that they found themselves in when they went to India. And and so those records are, are really um, revealing of the really tense atmosphere that's occurring between these Americans and the British in particular, once the Americans start showing up in numbers in India um, in, in 42. So, so no, I don't think Ben, I, I think Ben's 
thinking is is Ben's thinking. And I do try to shy away from suggesting, you know, that that somehow this is like representative of 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 others. Um, and uh, to me, that's kind of the beauty of these people. They're they're all people, and they're weird, and they have you know, sometimes they do stuff you, that makes sense and you, 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 you expect them to, and other times they do things that are surprising. And, um, you know, this methodology allows me to not, not have to try to shove them back in a box and to just let them be their full selves. <laughs> Holly, Mary, Nyack, your hand is up. Please unmute. If you could unmute. Okay, her hand is now down. That didn't work. Uh, if you want to write that question in the Q&A, uh, I can see it and I can read it. Uh, or you could try uh, uh, again. I, I will take this moment to, I have a million questions um, or observations. Um, uh, this was just an immensely readable book, um, I have to say. And your people are all very different. I think it's to your credit that you don't use them as the kind of representative types uh, and you let them unfold their stories, doing things you expect, things that you, you don't expect. But what struck me is that some characters in the book are more sympathetic on some levels than others. And so if you could put aside the South Carolina racial orientation, which is not easy, uh, but Ben Robertson does come across, particularly when he's in India, as somewhat a more sympathetic character. Um, Tamara is a extremely interesting uh, and sympathetic figure. And you use them to kind of recreate worlds um, through through your writing. But others are less so. Um, so Manuel Diaz, the fascist sympathizer working to support Franco's Spain, uh, George uh, Spiegelberg, um, uh, and Harry Seidel, not figures that necessarily anyone's going to think to put on a pedestal. But what you do for both those that you, I think, like more than others and those you like less than others is that you treat them with a rare respect. Uh, and you're not wagging your finger. Um, you're not telling us, the readers, just how retrograde their racial ideology is or their business practices are, though that does come across because those practices are not very good. Can you say something about your relationship to these figures in your book, your personal attitudes uh, on the one hand, and then as a writer and as an historian, how you sought to treat them and portray them? Uh, because I, I, I'm seeing you do something that's quite unusual in a lot of accounts. And I got to say, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for that, Eric. Um, and I'm glad to hear that you that that that's how you read what I was doing. There's, I think there's sort of two different things that I was, that I struggled with in writing this. Um, one is what you said, which is, you know, that I might personally be more sympathetic to some people than others. And I do try really hard to, to not have that be the story. Um, I, I think Manuel Diaz is one of the most interesting people in the sense that as a historian, I had to try to figure out why would it, why would this guy have these as you know why would he be you know so um, distrustful of the United States, so interested in um, toppling the Second Republic in in Spain, and you know risking everything to what it seems to be through all the documentation, um, you know giving information to U-boats about Allied convoys and smuggling materials and and spies and so forth. You know what what would what would make somebody do that. And, you know, that's what we do as historians. We try to understand people in times and places and, and what sort of shaped them and what, what kind of, you know, um, 
ideas that drive them, right? And, you know, if you think about Manuel Diaz, it's so interesting. I mean, this is a guy who was a child during the Spanish-American War in 1898, when the United States took Spain's last colonies. I mean, the United States went and just took them. <laughs> and the Spanish are really really upset. And this is not something that they, you know, have gotten over miraculously by World War One. Um, and so this is a common, you know, context you have to understand to understand, um, you know, why somebody might be suspicious of the United States and Britain. I mean, the Brit British are like hanging on to Gibraltar, right? So it's the despoilers of Cuba and Gibraltar, you know, the way this is the way that, that Spanish folks talk about it. So to me, he was an interesting challenge to write about as a historian because, you know, I had to sort of try to understand how somebody came to these sets of values, um, which are, you know, in the end, they become kind of pro-access values. And here's the thing, a lot of Americans shared pro-access values. Like this is actually not that uncommon of, a, of an, you know, an opinion. And so to me, it was important to try to not situate him as some sort of weird outlier, but as like part of you know, a vibrant right-wing world of, of fascist supporters. Um, he, I think some of the people come across, I wonder if it's like, if it's sympathetic or if it's more knowable. Because one thing that I found in working on these people is that some people were more knowable than others. You know, some people... Um, poured their hearts out in diaries. Ben does this. I mean, Ben wrote too much. I had too much information on Ben, you know, and some people try to hide who they are and they don't want anybody to know. And so it's really hard to, it was really hard to get at Manuel because he's literally, you know, trying to hide from the FBI and Harry who works for Standard Oil, Standard Oil, which is like the most secretive, you know, corporation um, that's going to destroy its records after the war. So we don't really fully know what, what, what they were up to. Um, they were hard to get to, you, you know, to just get next to, right? Um, and so I do think there's an imbalance between the stories in terms of who you can get next to, who you can really feel like you know, and who you can't. Now, ultimately, do we know any of these people? I think ultimately we don't know any of them, right? I mean, that's the that's the artifice of biography that and and the kind of historical work we're doing is to, you know, give this like beautiful you know, fantasy that we can like understand these people and know them. Do we really, I mean, do we really know our own family? Like that's, you know, like you want to get really philosophical, but I think there's sort of two different things was one was the challenge of trying to understand why people did what they did, even if it was things that I wouldn't do. And to not, like you said, insert my own sort of finger wagging or, you know, moralizing. But then the second was just balancing between different characters who were just more we're easier to understand than, than others from a, a documentary point of view, like in terms of the kinds of records I had that I could work with. Thank you. Katrin Schulteis's hand is up. If you would unmute, join the conversation. Yeah, excuse me. I haven't read the book, but I definitely want to. Um, so I wanted you to talk a little bit more, if you could, about how you see the actual relationship between sort of master narrative or bird's eye or whatever you want to call it, history that we're so familiar with in World War II um, and the kind of work that you're doing. Because I'm thinking you you gave the analogy of like Casablanca where, you know, everyone's, we meet all these people at Rick's Cafe and then you learn all their stories. Um, you know, similarly, you can think of any one of million, many, many novels where you learn all these different characters and then they all come together at this particular moment. So you could have, I mean, you could have had a cast of seven other different people, right? And you would have learned seven other different things. So um, I'm just wondering about the arbitrary quality in terms of uh, how we produce history, the sort of arbitrary quality of it, um, and how you see the relationship of these kind of random people to this bigger picture. Thank you. I mean, you know, it's funny because um, in some ways I think, yeah, if, there, if, you know, if I had done a different plane and it was a different group of people, it'd be a different, totally different story. But the more research I did, the longer I spent on this, the more I felt like, you know what, actually on some weird level, it would have been the same story. Like, you know, it could, because a lot of the people who didn't make the cut, who I didn't write about, I did research and it was kind of amazing how there, there were a lot of um, people I didn't focus on also loop back to some similar things like the 
the role of economic warfare, the importance of Southeast Asia, you know, the, the gender politics, the colonial, there, there were sort of themes that, that these seven folks allow me to pick up on that I think are not as odd as they should seem to us. That I think that on some level, we, I could repeat this experiment and it would tell a, a similar story. I mean, it would be different people, but I feel like we would still get a lot of the same big picture um, information. I don't know if that totally. Thank you. Could you say more about the research process? Um, this is a question that Christian often poses um, as part of the uh, Cold War International History Project. Um, uh, very interested in how we historians go about doing our business. And so you've talked about digital databases. Um, I know that I can't live without them. Almost never a day goes by when I'm not doing something uh, with digital archives or collections. Um, uh, it's just now indispensable. So this is part of what you're using, but that's not all. Um, so in the very final section, the note on method, you talk about certain archives you went to, and you also have this uh, great line about, you know, historians often go to archives, sometimes archives come to you. Uh, and you've had a fascinating experience here of someone providing you with invaluable information. Uh, and so both for, I think, the case of Frank and for Tamara, um, you had moments uh, uh, in which things are revealed to you that you might not otherwise have found. Could you just talk a bit more about the research and how you went about reconstructing the lives and the building blocks, both digital and especially non-digital, that allow you to do it? Yes, thank you. Um, so I think as in, in response to Mary earlier, um, early on, I wasn't really thinking I was going to do biographical research. I was just going to learn a little bit about these people and then use it to do a more conventional sort of chapter by chapter, you know, exploration of these, you know, non-combatant engagements. Um, but once I started finding things, it got very addictive. <laughs> and you refer to um, Frank. Frank, um, you know, he was a businessman in Southeast Asia in the 1930s. And, you know, we know, you know, um, private business records are very hard to come by. Uh, and then he was a radio reporter. And so, you know, it, he was on the radio. He didn't write print journalism. I couldn't go look up his articles, you know, in the newspapers and so on. He didn't have any children. Um, and so I thought I wasn't gonna be able to write about him. I really wanted to write about him because I thought, you know, he sounded really, really interesting. And so I found his great nephew on ancestry.com and then said, you know, hey, do you know anything about your great Uncle Frank, and he said, yes, I'll, I have all of his stuff in my closet, I'll send it to you. And this is the archive that came to me, big giant, you know, leather 1930s travel cases full of an absolutely amazingly rich 1930s business archive on a man who was selling like American toothbrushes and shaving cream all over Asia, you know. Um, and that got me a little addicted. To, and I was like, woo, if I could find this, what else can I find? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so um, I started contacting just a little bit, some other family members in places where I was running into a wall. So like, I didn't do this across the board, but in places where I really wanted to work on someone and I couldn't quite do it. Um, and in, in many cases, I was able to then get some documents. So there's the archive archive, then there's this like, people's closet and basement archive that we can now access because we can actually find re living relatives um, in ways that, you know, online genealogy have created that we didn't, we didn't have before. Um, so once I started figuring out that I could actually sort of resurrect these people's lives in a, in a way that felt textured and interesting and that I would do that, I, like I said, I decided quickly that I wasn't going to do biography like cradle to grave, that I was going to zero in on these certain particular moments. And so what I did was I did a lot of this digital work to locate people in time and place, but then I would go to archives to dig up, you know, all the other records, particularly government documents um, from the period. Like, so for example, like I said, the um, Indian, um, the, you know, the, the British colonial officials dealing with American journalists in, in India, that's at the, the, uh, that's in London. And, um, you know, um, George's work with the military, that's, you know, a lot of that stuff is at College Park. And so I did a lot of that digging in traditional archives. Um, and then what I did was I, 
I read around these people. So um, I read a lot of secondary sources written by non-US historians in order to contextualize people in these places. Um, and you know, Mary says I'm taking an easy shot at Ambrose, which I agree. But like, is David Kennedy's book all that different? I mean, it's you know, in in a sense, it's 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 a very similar kind of story. It's better, you know, it's it's richer. Um, but I think it's kind of hinging on the same kinds of um, assumptions. And if you look in Kennedy's footnotes. You know, he reads Gerhard Gephardt, who everybody reads the, you know, the global history of the war book, but otherwise all of his footnotes and all of his readings are American historians, basically. So American historians read other American historians of World War II. And I was really intent on, I'm gonna read non-US histories of the war. And I would use them to claim check my figures because when Americans travel around the world, they write about it. They tell you all about what's going on and they're, they don't, they don't, they're not telling you the whole story. And a lot of times they're actually telling you things that aren't true. And so if you don't, if you don't check what they say against non-American sources, you end up with a story that's one-sided and even worse is, is distorted. So, you know, Frank, he's running around Southeast Asia. He's having a great old time. He says, you know, the, the Indonesians, they don't care. They don't want to, you know, they just want to sit under the tree and play their games, which is like, Patently not true. But if you don't read Indonesian history, then you don't you you don't have you don't have ammo to sort of say, here's what Frank isn't seeing, here's what he doesn't understand. And so to me, it was really interesting to use that non non-US history research to push back against my characters and let the reader see more than they themselves saw. So what also struck me reading the book, and so we've talked a lot about you know the biographical dimension. But these people kind of don't kind of stand out in the way that, you know, many classical subjects of biographies do, but you use them to recreate worlds. Um, and this is what I found so compelling about what I was reading. You know, so whether it's Tamara's life history um, in which you take us from, uh, you know, Eastern Europe in the early 20th century to the moment of her death. And along the way, we learn all about the Bolshevik Revolution, the White Terror, uh, the world of theater. Uh, and left-wing politics in New York um, uh, in, in the 1930s. Uh, and for every one of the characters, uh, there is a world that is recreated, whether it's about commerce and law or whether it's about you know, international trade. Um, so the world looks different <laughs> um, uh, in part because you use these lives to kind of recreate um, in a kind of a broad canvas, um, a world that can't just be reduced to kind of a set of simple lines or or phrases but but the final question that i i want to return to that both of our discussants raised you know has to do with the nature of world war ii history itself um and i think your book in many ways stands as a powerful kind of refutation both in terms of kind of content and argument and method um of the easy target that is Stephen Ambrose, um, who is read by millions of people still today, despite everyone's best efforts. You know, he's still one of the go-to people, or Alex Kershaw, you know, and others who have basically captured the public market uh, on World War II history, and they capitalize on that memory boom uh, that you talk about and the glory and honor that goes to, to, to our veterans. Then there is the, the academic historians, you know, not just those who write about, um, uh, you know, the military affairs themselves, but people like uh, Elizabeth Samet, um, looking for the good war, my colleague Thomas Guglielmo, who writes about race in the war and the military side of it, um, uh, Mary Louise Roberts, um, you know, very uh, insightful work uh, on D-Day, the Normandy campaign, um, soldiers, the encounters with the French. Um, but this is a literature that, for worse or for better, Sam is the exception, remains kind of confined to the academy. Uh, and maybe it spills over a little bit, you know, into popular readers, but but you ain't got nothing compared to the market hold that Kershaw or that um, 
uh, that um, Ambrose uh, has. So this maybe is a plea to Oxford University Press to promote the book, um, you know, so that people will see it and will read it. But if you could just say a little bit more in conclusion uh, about that literature that you're pushing up against and how perhaps your work fits in with um, the newer literature uh, that is not Ambrose-esque, that does not put you know, every soldier who arrived in Europe or in Asia on a pedestal and we all have to bow down and, and celebrate them. Because um, I think, I think for, for both literatures, one you fit into uh, and amplify and the other you critique. If you could just reflect a little bit more on that. I like that. I like that phrasing, fit in and amplify, because I mean, Mary Lou Roberts work, I mean, you can add Susan Brothers, there's all kinds of folks yes. um, doing that kind of work that I admire and I would like to think I'm sort of contributing to. I mean, Roberts is a good example of, you know, what if we don't just take American points of view for granted, but we actually use sources from others. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of work being coming out now um, Guglielmo is another great example of this. Um, Matthew Delmont's book, his new book. Um, I, we're, we're seeing right now, I think, a kind of renewed boomlet of work on World War II, maybe precisely because we're sort of post this, you know, the, the I don't know, the Ambrose era. But, you know, it does, it, I don't think it's going to make a larger dent in the, in the sort of you know, popular imagination until we figure out how to sort of tell that story cinematically. I don't know. Is that the right way to think about it? Um, you know, am, what am I contributing to like the Max Hastings world of literature? I do think that there is something to be said for thinking about the relationship between um, the military terrains that are usually foregrounded in those types of works and the logistical stories that I'm, that I'm telling. Um, I'm thinking of pa Paul Kennedy's book on engineers sort of does this work a bit. Interestingly though, that book also starts at the end of the war that if you look at that, that's late 43 on. Um, so um, I don't see myself as sort of overturning anything. I just trying to, I'm trying to figure out a way to make this come alive and sort of bring some of the sensibilities that I think people like Roberts and said Herman, um, Fredman, um, you know, Guglielmo, all these folks who ha have returned to this war um, and seen something in it that I think we kind of lost maybe at the end of the, at the end of the 20th century, um, when it seemed to have a lot more play in popular venues, the history channels created, you know, becomes, World War II channel in like five seconds. Um, um, you know, I think professional historians kind of, you know, we're working more on other things, a lot of them. Um, and now maybe we're returning, we're returning to this. Um, and so I expect to see a lot more really good work on this um, coming up um, in the next few years. Well, with regard to your comment about the, the cinematic aspect, this would be a very good Netflix, Amazon, or BBC program. Having just watched the first episode of World on Fire, I'd much rather watch this uh, as a serialized production uh, than that. Um, so I unfortunately have to draw this to a close right now. There's a lot more in this book that we didn't and couldn't get to, uh, given just how rich uh, the book is. Um, and as folks have said, it's an immensely readable book uh, and not just a learned one. Please uh, uh, thank uh, our, our audience. Uh, I want to thank um, uh, Brooke, uh, Eric, Mary, and Christian uh, for joining us this afternoon. And I would invite everyone back uh, one week from today on October 23rd, when we reconvene to discuss a new book by Stephanie Freeman entitled Dreams for a Decade, International Nuclear Abolition and the End of the Cold War. Till then, thanks very much. And everyone, take care and be safe. <laughs>